Monday Zero Tolerance for FGM, so that's why we chose to do it today. And I'm going to just give you a little bit of a run through of what we're going to, who we're going to hear from and what we're going to hear about. So um, we're going to first of all talk a little bit about what is reconstruction surgery for FGM survivors and should it be available on the NHS. Um, Natasha's going to do a wonderful presentation on psychosexual therapy and explain um, what it is and how we can use it for FGM survivors. Um, Forward are going to launch their research. Um, and then we're going to go and sit on some tables and have some group discussions and a bit of chat. We are going to record, we don't want to record anybody's name, but we're going to try and just record the discussion so we could maybe use that later um, for publication. So I'll explain that a little bit later. Um, and then we're going to launch our, well, I'm not going to, Janet's going to launch our parliamentary mm -hmm. petition. So please feel free to get up and get a drink if you need to. Um, it's very informal, it's very chilled. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. So I'm Hulam Hamlet, a few specialists in midwife with uh, So I see women who are subject to FGM, so see pregnant women, learned pregnant women over 18 years old. And they were here to make changes, mark the day, and I want you to go home today thinking uh, survivors need a voice, and the voices are among you guys. So let's walk together and make the difference today. Thank you, Hida. Lovely. Uh, I'm Juliette Albert. I'm an FGM specialist in life. I work at um, the Imperial College just down the road at the Sunflower Clinic. And we're also going to hear today from Natasha Anderson Foster. Um, Natasha will introduce herself, I'm sure, when she does her presentation. Uh, Nana, as well, will introduce herself when she does hers. And um, we've also got Janet File from the RCM, and Janet also will say, I'm sure, a little bit about herself when, when um, she does her presentation. So, who are we and <laughs> why are we here? Um, we call ourselves the Restore Project at the moment. This is subject to change, so we're going to, one of our questions in our group discussions is going to be to ask you guys if you, if you like that name or if you think there's a, we should have a different name. Um, we're a group of FGM experts, so we are, there are in, within our group there are FGM survivors or women with lived experience of FGM. There are various different healthcare professionals um, midwives, doctors, counsellors or therapists, health advocates and we also have charity workers and campaigners um, and we all voluntarily meet once a month for an hour on a Monday at 6 o'clock and try and, <laughs> and talk about what we're, what we're, what we're going to do next um, and why are we doing it. So basically we are looking into establishing a national centre of excellence, offering reconstruction surgery and psychosexual therapy for FGM survivors provided by the NHS within a research setting. So I'm going to explain what that means because there's lots of kind of words in there. Um, oh, have I gone? So yeah, the aims of the project. So we've been looking at the evidence really that you, underpins. You, yeah. Sorry yeah. to talk. Can we get the slides later? Because we're all scribbling away. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll send you the slides. Don't scribble. We can definitely forward them. As long as you wrote your, your email address or your phone number clearly, you can definitely. I'll send them to everyone. Um, so we, we want to, first of all, we've been reviewing the evidence that underpins reconstruction surgery. Um, we want a new service, but for us, it's really important that that service is co designed with the women that might be using it. So we want to co-design it as a collaboration. Um, and that means having patient and public involvement, and that means having a very inclusive and transparent process. We, we have realized that we have to lobby as part of that project, because that's how you get change, I guess. So lobbying the Department of Health, the NHS, so that we can generate a tariff for women. That means basically to make sure that um, clinicians who do reconstruction surgery get paid for it. And we need, basically, NHS need to kind of commission a service. It has to be done properly. 
what we don't want is for women to have to go privately and pay for it, basically. Um, we want to publish about what we're doing because that's how we share our information. And we want money. We need, we need a grant, hopefully from the NIHR, which is the kind of, uh, it's basically the research arm of the NHS. We're going to be applying for a lot of money, and we want the money to pay for the research and the service. And we've already actually got a web page, and on that web page we want to create some materials with basically information um, for everybody about what is reconstruction and again why, why we're doing this project. So, what is reconstruction surgery? Do you want to explain? <laughs> So we're aiming to originally, so basically we're aiming for those who undergo um, FGM, so they have the scar tissue, nerve damage, especially when you involve the survivors, there's different types, you've got type 1, type 2, type 3. Type 1 is the movement of fetus food, and sometimes women end up with long-term complication, nerve damage, and when they come to us, they start to move to doing any movement. Type 2 again, genitalia, maybe a menorah removed, small lips, maybe a matura, and again, they end up with nerve damage. Sometimes they have um, they have problems with urinating, they have problems with their period, they have problems with their infancy, they have ongoing pain, they can't even sit down and keep jobs. Mm -hmm. yeah? And those women will explain to you when they come to the clinic, I feel like there's cyst growing in my genitalia. But there's no cyst growing, it's a nerve damage. The next comes hyperstimulating, so they cause really pain. And you've got women who also got type 3, so removal of the total pubic menorah, clitus food, and everything's removed. So the scar tissue, small opening, we open the scar tissue and that's it. So they're left with low soft skin, um, difficult intimacy, long term, both mental and physical for women. And really, uh, when we talk to those survivors, they have no, you have no idea, every night they live with that body image the trauma that they become as children, but they want closure, they want to feel whole again. And there's a service that we can do, unfortunately it's not available in India. And then to improve the um, sexual function, also to reduce pain. So all those things comes into the constructions which we don't have in India. So that's all. Yeah. Next slide. So the mo three most common reasons why women seek you know, construction, like I say, to take your pain, improve the sexual pleasure, body image concerns, yeah? So there are different techniques for reconstruction surgery. So one of the things to say is there are 26 clinics across Europe that offer reconstruction surgery. So in uh, Sweden, Spain, Italy, France, Germany, the Netherlands. Um, and in France, they've been doing reconstruction surgery since 1998. So we're, we're way behind, it seems, in the UK. And there are different techniques for reconstruction surgery. So part of our work is to look into this and bring together a multidisciplinary team of surgeons to basically make sure we get the best technique possible. <coughs> and this was just to try and explain a little bit more about exactly what reconstruction surgery is. So basically, in some cases, what the surgeon would be doing is to pull up the root of the clitoris that's remaining under the skin, because if you imagine the top little bit may have been removed, what we call the clitoral glands. So that they, they might pull up the root and that might give more sensation and for, for body image as well, and it might relieve some pain. Sometimes they might even be taking some tissue from another part of the body and using that instead. So it's kind of like grafting um, a clitoral glands, and then some of the surgeries is more is also sorry looking at creating lips. So if the lips have been removed, or for some women the inner lips uh, there's only on one side or partially removed. So the idea about reconstruction is there's as I said there's different techniques. There is this one is this is very technical, um, and this is kind of explaining again the different techniques. So. I will forward the presentation to anyone who wants it and then you can see there's a reference at the bottom if you want to read about it in a bit more detail about the different techniques. So the other thing just to say is, I think Huda made it quite clear as well, for some women we can't really help them at the moment, we're, like, we're not sure what to do to help them. So for example with pain during sexual intercourse, um, you might be offered lub lubricants 
you know, like some uh, lubricating jelly, um, some kind of hormonal cream you might be offered. You might be told to avoid activities like cycling because it might put pressure on the area. Uh, you might get to see the physio. I know we've got some lovely physios mm. here. Hello, lovely to see you here. Um, you might even be offered kind of some sort of anaesthetic gel. But one of the things we're not offering is surgery to sort of try and put back what's been taken away. And that's missing off our list. And for those of us that work in clinics, we're finding that people have heard about reconstruction through maybe social media, friends and family, and they're saying to us, can we have that? And we've got nothing, we'd like, sorry, we just don't do that here. So I think a lot of particularly people who work in the specialist services are feeling really strongly that we've got to change something. And also the younger women now, the younger they are, you know, they're reading about social media, and you know they know the European country what they're doing, and the question mark is why are we not getting here? So they feel like if they have money, they would have gone and get it. So if we have cases who actually so funded is so expensive, and the outcome is always you know the healing process it takes a year maybe, and we have to also um, that money comes into the NHS as well. So it's a long term um, support that we really need. Yeah, one of the things is that if women have to have it done privately, they're going abroad, and that means they've got to travel there, they've got to pay for a hotel to stay perhaps, they've got to pay for the surgery. Also, we don't want women going underground and seeking it out privately perhaps in this country by somebody who's unregulated. Um, so there, these are the reasons why we want the NHS to provide this service. So the other thing is psychosexual therapy is really important. And Natasha's going to explain all of that to us, but I think that what we can see very clearly is very, very few clinics have a psychosexual therapist co-located with me, and we're just not offering it very often in the UK, whereas actually a lot of the clinics in Europe have got a psychosexual therapist working there. Um, we find that it's, it's possible that for some women having psychosexual therapy means they then decide they don't need or want surgery anymore, and we want to make sure women have that option, because obviously, Basically, surgery can be risky. We all know that. Any surgery is not 100% always successful. And so we need to make sure that women are really properly and safely prepared before surgery and have the right support afterwards as well. So for us, trauma therapy, but also psychosexual therapy is really important. So I wanted to just give you a very brief example of a clinic that's running in Belgium. They call it Semavi which uh, obviously I went to be Belgium, but Medical Centre in Aid of Victims you know, that case issue. Um, they did reconstruction surgery for 107 women between 2014 and 2016. It's reimbursed by Belgian Social Security, so they don't have to actually you know, pay. And it's run by a gynecologist, a midwife, a psychologist, and a sexologist. And one thing that's really interesting about it is they have to, it's mandatory for the women to have five consultations. And I think that's really interesting because it's meant to safeguard the women. The idea is then they're not just turning up one day and having surgery straight away. They're, there's a process that they go through to make sure they're really, really ready and it's safe for them. So, for example, this is the pathway within that Belgian clinic. And one of our questions is to, to be asking whether. You guys think that's a good idea too, basically. Um, so in that clinic, it's not a paper that's really reporting on the outcomes, but one of the things that they, some of the things they've said is there were, there were no deaths or life-threatening complications, but healing can sometimes take quite a long time. I mean, 12 weeks is, is a long time, isn't it? Um, the pain can be severe and it can trigger memories, upsetting memories, and there are sometimes some short-term complications, so for example, bleeding, uh, stitches coming undone, infection, urine retention, as you'd expect for any so genital surgery. Yeah. So just to say, we have done a scoping review already. Uh, it's hopefully going to be published by the British Journal of Oxford Dying. We reviewed 40 publications, so these are kind of academic publications that were looking at reconstruction, and in total, these are just those that are published, so this is not the number of women overall in the whole world who've had reconstruction, but this is just from these papers, 
there were, as you can see, 7,751 women underwent surgical reconstruction. That was between 2012 and you know, basically 2022. 40% um, saw an actual multidisciplinary team. So for us, that's really important. We're really advocating a multidisciplinary team. Um, 15 studies had some psychosexual counseling, so not all of them. That's 37.5%. 97% of women reported an improvement after reconstruction surgery. And you can see afterwards things like sexual function, pain, body image, bulb of appearance, um, intimate relationships. So, you know, there were, there were things that different people were pleased with different things, if you see what I mean. And there were some complications, but look how few, 3.9%. So, in terms of surgery, that is really, you know, really, really good, really successful. So, do you want to do a little bit about why the project's important? Should I keep going from there? No, that's fine. I'll keep that's going. Either way. Okay, so, we know there's no service in the UK. Uh, I've already said there's lots of services, not just in Europe, but also in parts of Africa, um, in the USA, um, in France, more than 6,000 patients since 1998. So this is not new surgery, this is being done in lots of different places, but just not here. Um, we know that not all women who've had FGM want reconstruction, we're not suggesting that, okay? It's really just that they could have access to it if they want to. So that's, that's a really important point. Um, we think this is a health inequality, it's a social injustice, and it's unethical. Yeah, I think it's racist. Have the choice. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so the women who come to us, and also the study shows, a majority of them, when they have the counselling and the assessment and what have you, remember what I say to you, someone will actually go to pay, so they do need the surgery. There's no option for them. They, they have to have some sort of surgery input. So those women who would have the psychosexual therapy, um, I remember meeting Jasmine after class, and she sometimes said you, she's a... Um, a consultant who does surgery in Switzerland, and she's been doing over 10 years now, so yeah, and she said the majority of women who come to her, they do the counselling, and some women will say, thank you so much, I'm happy what you showed me, and I'm going to go home. But some women will need the surgery because of pain, because of self-esteem, so they can make them better. But the option has to be there for the woman to decide what they want to do. And the survivors we see in our clinics are exactly equality, identical. Why? Why is this not happening in the UK? Why is where actually the evidence shows this works, yeah? So, um, in the UK, you know, women can access post-cancer vulval surgery, um, gender reassignment surgery, you know, you can make a man's genitals into a woman's genitals in this country. It's free, then things are free on the NHS. So why don't we have it here? And I've already said, you know, there are health risks associated with going abroad to have it done or doing it kind of underground. Um, this is really important. Why do we want to make it kind of part of research? Um, I, I, I'm concerned that women will be worried that they're kind of guinea pigs, you know. And obviously, the first women that have reconstruction in this country, it, it will be new. But what we will make sure is that the surgeons are properly trained. So myself and Dahlia are going off to Geneva next week to get some training. And hopefully everybody, yeah. lots of people will. The masterclass is yeah. also online. So if you can't travel, I'm, I'm going to be online as well. So you can do online. It's quite interesting. Yeah. Um, so we want it to be we want it to be in a research setting because we want to contribute to the evidence base. Number one, we know that the WHO said that there wasn't enough evidence to recommend reconstruction. So we need to contribute to that evidence. If you do something within a research setting, so like a clinical trial, it means you have really, really, really strict ethical guidelines. Believe you me, I know because I've been recently having to go through that process. It's really tough. And it has to be transparent, it gets really well scrutinised. I mean, actually, in the UK, we're really brilliant at research. Um, and we lead in a lot of areas in research. Um, and we want to fund the service, so the research is going to help actually fund the setting up of the service. So the drivers are, as I said earlier, women requesting reconstruction. Um, we, we say we want to deliver patient-centered care, so why aren't we listening to what patients say they want? Um, we 
want to improve outcomes for women, but also for their families, for communities, and that actually it reduces the burden on the NHS because if we have um, surgery that women want, then there'll be fewer maybe mental health issues going on. So those kind of things are really important, as well as genital pain, um, obviously sexual function as well. So, so far, we did get a £10,000 grant from the Urology Foundation. Thank you to them for paying for some of the food. We've got a web page. We've submitted our scoping review. We've done already some workshops. A workshop with patients, not patients, sorry, that's the wrong word, with FGM survivors to ask them what they think about reconstruction surgery. We're hoping today is going to be our stakeholder, national stakeholder meeting, so that's why we're going to involve you in some of our decision making. We have set up a parliamentary petition, which we're going to show you later, and we've partnered with Oxford Surgical Trials Unit, they're really hot, they're really on it, I should say, this Oxford Surgical <laughs> Trials Unit, and they're kind of scrutinising what we're doing and, and helping us, supporting us. Um, and patient and public involvement is so, so, so important because basically you're the experts and you are making sure we're accountable for what we're doing. You're, you're helping make decisions, so we're co-designing, co-producing, and you can help us share this information and spread this information. So our members, so far, this is not everybody, but most of us are here, not everybody can make it today. Um, these are some of our members. These are saying who, who we are and what we do. Um, there's quite a few of us actually. <laughs> it's, it's growing. Um, and like I said, everybody's joining for free in their own time um, because they care about this issue. Um, and thank you to Forward. Forward have contributed to our lovely food, and Amanda's going to speak to us later. The Urology Foundation, and Susie Alneal, who isn't here and I think isn't going to be able to make it. It's, she's stuck in surgery in yeah. theatre. Um, but her Pelvic Care Fund also has contributed some funding. So thank you very much to all our funders. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. This is just uh, to, so you hear a little bit more about Ford soon. Uh, the Urology Foundation. We've also got lovely Hecate from Manor Gardens who are supporting us. Part of the project, Midday, uh, Royal College of Midwives, and uh, uh, Holistic Support, yeah. So thank you so much for listening. Natasha, you're up. My name is Natasha Anderson Foster. I'm a psychosexual therapist based in Birmingham. I'm also a clinical supervisor and a registered, registered psycho, psychosexual therapist. My presentation is we're going to talk about psychosexual therapy. I'm going to explain to you how I work with um, survivors or, of um, FGMC and people that have experienced trauma. So just around consent, um, just to let you know that this presentation contains sexualized informa descriptions, sexual information, and three slides containing a genital diagram. So just consider how you're going to look after yourself. Um, and I'll just do I have consent to accept the intimacy issues in relationships, working with, within a relationship, individuals or groups. It's non-judgmental therapy for individuals to express their sexual concerns and explore solutions. It includes sex education, individual counselling, relationship exploration and negotiated and or agreed work. So I tend to use a biopsychosocial model and in the which for, for assessment um, and in the biological assessment we're looking at the hormonal influences, genetic factors, neurological factors and how these can impact sexual function and behaviour. In the psychological aspect we're looking at thoughts, emotions, past traumas, mental health issues, 
self-esteem and body-related issues, and how they influence. Sorry. And how they influence sexual well-being. And with the social aspect, we're looking at the cultural norms, cultural and societal norms, family Sorry. dynamics, relationships, issues, and environmental uh, factors. But I'm also a anti um, anti oppressive practitioner. And I also like to uh, integrate social justice models in the psychotherapy that I deliver. So what does what issues does psychosexual treat? I call it we call it PST for short. So if you are around people who practice psychosexual therapy, you may find that they use the term uh, the, they they use PST. We treat performance anxiety, so dealing with worries about sexual performance, desire discrepancies, addressing differences in sexual desire between partners, body image issues, communication issues, improving communication about sexual needs and preferences, painful intercourse, so that can be an anticipation of pain, it doesn't always have to have a medical background, and sometimes doctors will refer to this as vaginismus, otherwise referred to as an inability to tolerate uh, penetration. Orgasm difficulties, addressing the challenges in achieving orgasm, erectile problems, early and rapid ejaculation, including delayed ejaculation, and sexual trauma recovery, um, and how um, we can support individuals in overcoming the impact of sexual trauma um, on, on intimacy. And sometimes when we're working with couples, we can have like vaginismus and premature and, and not premature and early ejaculation. So we can have a dual um, dysfunction. So how common are sexual problems in the UK? They are common. Um, there was a study, a probability study done by the called Natsal 3, um, and it's called the Sexual Attitudes and Life Lifestyle. Um, in Britain, and that surveyed 15, just over 15,000 people between 2010 to, 2000, to 2012, and they found that in the UK, one in four men and women who were in a relationship did not share the same level of sexual interest, and one in six reported a health condition that affected their sex lives in the past year. And one in five men and women who were in a relationship said that their partners had experienced sexual difficulties in the past year. So, sexual problems are common. But what do we know about FGMC, uh, FGMC and psychosexual therapy or sexual, um, or, or sexual function? Well, right at the top of the list, we know that not all women who have FGMC have issues with sexual function. Sexual desire, interest and arousal can be impacted by FGMC. Body image issues can impact arousal and desire, and women who have experienced FGMC are more likely to develop psychological disorders such as post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, phobias, low self-esteem. But we also know that mental health issues anyway can cause issues with sexual function. Studies show a more impaired sexual function in women with FGMC, who have experienced FGMC, and research suggests that not feeling like a woman was reason for wanting reconstructive surgery. That's what research suggests. So, as I said, I'm just going to, that the, that's, the, 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 that's the image, okay, so just, I'm now going to put the slide on, is that okay, yeah, okay, so, anatomy clarity, this is the vulva, not the vagina, and when I was growing up, I called this the vagina, I, this was the vagina up until probably I was, 21, this was the vagina. Yeah. But it's the vulva, and it's, um, so it just refers to the genital area encompassing the mons pubis, where the landscape, where pubic hair sits upon. Um, we've got, it houses the clitoral head, the clitoral head, vaginal and urethral opening. 
the prepuce, which is a fold of skin which just covers the, the clitoral head, the clitoral gland, the labia minora, labia majora, the vestibule, and the perianum. This slide speaks for itself, really. It's just to talking about talking about um, pleasure and um, and how each area contributes to, to pleasure. The vulva is sensitive to light touch and pressure, offering pleasure and exploration. This is the kind of information that I would give to a client, um, to any client. We start off with um, psychoeducation. Just letting them know about their body and the function and, and, and talking about pleasure and arousal and desire and how it can be achieved. This is the clitoris. I, until I became a psychosexual therapist, didn't know that this is what the actual body of the clitoris looks like. I've actually got a, <laughs> I've got a model if anybody wants to pass it around. Oh, and you can get to So, we've got the clitoral, the, um, the glands of the clitoris, the carpus carbonosum, which is the rectal tissue, and when um, the arousal is present, that area becomes erect. We've got the bowl of, of, of the clitoris as well, which also becomes um, engorged when aroused during arousal. We've got Bartholin's glands at either side of the vaginal opening, which um, produce uh, lubrication on arousal as well. And some of this might sound familiar if you've heard things such as like Bartholin cysts and things like that. It kind of all makes sense. Um, but it's just to see that the clitoris is a bit like an ice, it's a bit like an iceberg, isn't it? So some facts about the clitoris. It has over 8,000 nerve endings, resembles an iceberg, as I said, with the majority of its activities hidden beneath the surface. It's singularly designed for pleasure. It defies the aging process, making it one of the only parts of the body that remains perpetually youthful. It embraces diversity as every clitoris is uniquely different in its form and function. And historically, doctors advocated for clitoral removal as a misguided cure for mental illness, like depression and schizophrenia, or to address perceived um, issues of women desiring sex. And this was between like the 1800s, 1900s, done primarily in Europe and America. So your brain on sexual well-being, or your brain and sexual well-being, I say to my clients that your brain is your biggest sexual organ, really. Um, a lot of people think it's all happening on a genital level. But I say it's, it's happening up here, up in your brain. The brain is key for sexual pleasure, interpreting signals and releasing pleasure-related neurotransmitters. Emotional responses to stimuli, to touch, are processed in the brain. The brain's memory recalls past experiences, including FGMC trauma, which can impact sexual pleasure. And the brain processes beliefs, attitudes, and expectations, shaping a woman's post-FGMC sexual experience, or just shaping our sexual experiences full stop. The brain controls hormones like oxytocin and dopamine for bonding and pleasure. The brain processes pain signals impacting its response to sexual stimuli for those with FGMC-related discomfort. The brain is crucial 
in the mind and body connection for arousal, desire, and overall sexual satisfaction. And the brain's role in mental health is important for overall sexual pleasure. Addressing, um, addressing mental health aspects is essential. So I thought, what are the ingredients? What are the ingredients? And I came up with a list of what the ingredients are for a positive sexual or intimate experience. <coughs> Communication, <coughs> consent and control, feeling in control, and clear consent are important for survivors. Relaxation and comfort, creating a comfortable, relaxed environment, easy uses anxiety, education and understanding, knowing about FGMC, knowing about FGMC anatomy, and knowing about your body, post-FGMC anatomy, and sexual health, and how the survivors to make informed decisions. Foreplay and lubrication, and emotional connection, so building emotional intimacy promotes a sense of safety and trust. Mindfulness and relaxation techniques. You can find um, brief five minutes relaxation mindfulness videos on YouTube. Patience and self-compassion. Being patient and practicing self-compassion can help survivors to navigate their own journey and pace. Advocacy and support groups. So engaging with advocacy groups, um, having that sense of community and shared experiences. But also missing from this is friendship. Friendship, finding out what somebody's social circles are like. Counseling and sex therapy will help to address barriers, promoting a positive sexual mindset and um, clients own exploration of their pleasure. So these are the potential outcomes for uh, psychosexual therapy. I don't, I won't read that slide, but these are the potential outcomes. We've already heard that psychosexual therapy is um, is, is quite, it's is quite, it's not easy to get on the NHS. I'm quite lucky to be a psychosexual therapist in the NHS, but I also work in private practice as well. Um, so if you're looking for psychosexual therapy, I'd go to um, approach your local sexual health clinic to see if they have a psychosexual therapist there, some FGMC, FGMC services, um, the College of Sex and Relationship Therapists, uh, have a list of psychosexual therapists and these will be private they will be in private practice but also for general counselling and psychotherapy because we know that the, the, the evidence says that they're more likely to experience um, issues with mental health so we know that general counselling is recommended so our community partners that are here today and um, who offer counselling can you, can you put your hands up if you've got anyone here today that offers counselling? Three, four, five. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, um, get your links with community partners. I'm, you know, I'm in Birmingham, so get your links. But also there's the Black African and Asian therapy network as well. I'm, I, I'm all for people having therapy in their mother tongue as well. So what I find is that I have to use language line at, at work. If you've heard it's a telephone interpreting service. Look, I'd rather um, someone speak their, their first language than have to uh, try and explain their emotions to me um, in English. And I still feel like I can still get a felt sense when when they do that. And then we've got um, the UK Council of Counselling and Psychotherapy and the British Association of Counselling. I want to thank the Contemporary Institute of Clinical Sexology for letting me use those 
pictures, uh, those diagrams, which they had specially commissioned for them because they wanted images of women of colour, of, of, of people of colour. Um, and also, this is a call for more psychosexual therapists as well to do their training. That's their email address. <laughs> That's their website there. Um, I'm Natasha Anderson Foster. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
And with all my education, I've been circumcised. My mother's been circumcised. My grandmother's been circumcised. So it's run for generations in our home. I didn't even know. It wasn't even an issue. Even though I'm a gender activist and a political scientist, well-educated up to master's level, I didn't even know anything about the issue. It's a taboo topic, and nobody ever spoke about this. So this is an activist. So really speaking out and hearing about and people's experiences also became a critical factor. And this was also either the health or the human rights or the legal implications that made people want to work on that year. Um, the death factor was also something, this is somebody's experience, it was a midwife in the UK. I remember I went home to ask my grandmother about FGM. She looked at me as if to say, what's she talking about? It was later on that I realized that this, my paternal grandmother, who was from Ghana, did not practice FGM. So she didn't know what I was talking about because I did not get a favorable answer from her. I was disappointed. So I started asking questions and doing research herself in order for her to really get into the understanding of, of issues about FGM. The second issue was the scope of activism. And the three things that we found was awareness raising and advocacy within the communities that they come from. And this uh, evening, having conversations with Gina, she was actually saying awareness raising and community conversations is so critical, particularly on raising awareness for people to come to services. So how do diaspora change makers really go to the grassroots to make this happen? Care and support for women with FGM, culturally appropriate care. And we actually realized that there was a lot of work that was also being done by specialist services. And some of them was also uh, done by organizations. And so care for women was also very, very important. And the third one was generating evidence uh, to support advocacy and counter uh, myths of FGM. We know that there are so many myths and misconceptions that continue to persist and fewer lecture. Natasha, you were talking about research, and we know that research is so critical. Juliet, we know that research data collection is so important. And again, yeah. we've got a lot of uh, diaspora change makers who are working as researchers. So it's really important to explore that. Having courage to start conversations of FGM, and this was about a US uh, a lady. She said, when I commuted between my home and my workplace by train, I was sitting next to a total stranger and asked, have you ever heard of anything called FGM? <laughs> I received all kinds of different responses and reactions, but one thing I encourage me is that nobody ever said, go away. <laughs> I am tired, I don't want to hear, I don't want to talk. People were always interested in hearing what I had to say, and I realized at the end of my commute every day, I have talked at least two people about FGM. So some people said they had heard of FGM, but said it does not happen anymore. This response often opened a door for conversations. So again, I know that we have a colleague at Forward, and she's always talking about FGM, and sometimes I said, Mary, will you not stop talking about FGM? <laughs> Every chance I have to say, do I talk about FGM? So I know that there are a lot of people like that in, in you know, uh, and being brave. It's uh, you know, opening the conversation. Some people find it very difficult. But sometimes from the diaspora, you don't really find it so difficult. So again, we need to learn how to open conversations. I'm not going to go through the details, but this was also the impact of some of their activism. Some reported activities brought about behavior change. But what I put in red is what I really want because it matters to us. One participant started the only support group exclusively for women mm -hmm. FGM survivors, which sponsors them to undergo reconstructive surgery. Mm -hmm. So I really would like to follow up and find out how this was also being done because this is so important. Mm -hmm. This has had a tremendous impact on women's lives, not just physically, but in their sex lives and also psychologically. Mm -hmm. So again, it's really important to see how diaspora change makers are really propagating some of the good work, particularly around reconstructive surgery. And really funding to make it happen uh, is really, really important. How best do you care for women with FGM? Do no harm is so, so critical. We were talking about the issue of do no harm. And this is the story of a 20-year-old lady who had a panic attack when she came for demon fibrillation. When she recovered, um, I think even at the time they said she nearly fainted. And when she recovered and she you know, was asked about it, she said what had triggered her anxiety episode was the label on the door to the surgery said minor procedure room. Mm -hmm. We need to be very careful. A minor procedure room for her was uh, in my country, SBM was performed on me at a hospital. And on the door where the procedure was performed, the sign was the same, minor procedure room. 
So when I saw the sign, I was immediately reminded of my FGM experience. I removed the sign from the dog whenever the clinic was in session. This was a health professional in the UK. So again, it really shows the extent of how we need to go very carefully and sensitively because you never know what will trigger somebody. And if a woman is coming for a service and just something at the door can trigger her, what else is going to trigger women? So we need to be really clear about that. Change makers face a lot of challenges. Uh, being a black woman in Spain is also an issue because the organization is black led, funding is very hard to obtain. A friend once advised me to put a white Spanish CEO so that she would more readily receive funding. It's also true. I told her over my uh, my dead body, I would rather sell some Moses and <laughs> <laughs> so I do this. The authorities do not take us seriously because the organization is run by black like women. This can be quite frustrating. So again, we have to look at funding and who is getting funding when it comes to these issues. A lot of uh, diaspora organizations, individuals, we are the lead, but when it comes to management, leadership roles, etc., etc., it becomes very problematic. The biggest challenge came from the community which said, I should not be talking, speaking about FGM. It was very hard when I started to talk on FGM in the community. I was called mates. I was told, you are this here, you are that. Not very nice things. Sometimes it became very scary and I felt that I could not continue my activism. And I almost wanted to give up. This is somebody in France, but it's not only here. We have a lot of women who have actually had this experience. And to this day, some people still talk about this. Uh, recently, they say, but why are you always talking about FGM? Why are you always talking about vaginas? You know, so the issue is that a lot of people really, really uh, get a backlash about these things. Survivors need recognition and acknowledgement. And as we talk about investing in survivors, they do not take me seriously. And yet, it's because I exist. I who have been cut, these others have become specialists and are recognized. If their specialists have studied about FGM and then become specialists over my vagina, it's because of the information they got from us who have been cut. I think my cat vagina is all the specialism I need. In France, they have the habit of considering FGM survivors as victims and not as experts. So again, repeatedly, we have to always recognize the important role the survivors play in really bringing up issues, in really making, putting FGM on the agenda, but also making the FGM an issue of concern, not only in Europe, but also in our countries of origin. So, thanks you, and it's been a pleasure to meet you. We're going back into the future where we started before we got all the legislation, we got the police, we got everybody else. And you know what? I want to tip my hat to Miss Jane Ellison. She was the Minister for Public Health. And all those clinics that you see out there, the money that we got, all the um, communications with government, all the intergovernmental stuff that went on. I'm just going to say that. I want to say that because she's sitting there hiding in the corner, but she's in our corner. Okay, so we have you, you, you saw the aims of the of what we've been doing. But well, one of the things we need to do is to lobby government and not in nice terms. Jane will tell you about it. We're good friends, but we didn't speak to her nicely at the beginning when we wanted to It's to lobby government to make sure they do the things that we want them to do and to get them to debate in parliament about the issue. Because uh, FGM in its entirety and the attention paid to it by government and, um, and provision of services particularly around reconstruction is a non-starter. It's fatiguing government. So what we're doing is to launch the parliamentary petition and thank you to Juliet and the group for working so hard on it. And um, when we get to 10,000 signatures, we will get a government uh, response. 100,000, we will get a debate in parliament. So we're going to be showing you the QR code, expertly done by this guy here. Thank you very much. So it's not just to show it to you, it's for you to pass it on to everyone you meet in the street. Give them the QR code. Yeah. 
The next page. So it's coming, the QR code is coming. Okay. Just, I just want you to publicize this. If we want to get anywhere, we need the signatures. We need all of you to be the captains of what's going to happen in the future for women who have had FGM, for survivors, and for all of us, the clinicians, because even though they're doing the work, we have to be behind them, encouraging them by not being nice to government, but by being really awful and telling them what they're not doing. So over to you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here with all these faces. And all the teams work hard and except Julia, she's a hard worker and she's doing well as, as usual. And I'm so happy I'm here with the nice and lovely ladies from our community, different community. And we are here, we have a right to do something for women, for our community. We are together, we can do it, we can make it. Why not? Petition is a lobbying and campaigning tool. And if we get a hundred thousand signatures, we would have caught the attention of the government. Because at the moment, the women who are suffering don't necessarily raise their voices. So we, signing that petition, are the ones raising our voices on their behalf. So the best thing you could do today to help those women who need reconstruction surgery is to sign the petition and thank you very much.